Hello, everybody, and welcome to um, this supplement episode. I don't even know what we would call this. What would we call this? Mm -hmm. I'm Matt, the paperback junkie. Matt Wall. Matt Wallafuco. Amy Fisher's ex. And I'm here with my... And you're here. <laughs> With Zoe. Yay! Yay! Hi. hi. Now, I was going to do this show by myself, but when I was talking about what I was going to do with Zoe, she was like, oh my gosh, this is awesome. You're so amazing. And I don't think I said that. Okay. Well, I was like sitting there going, how can I possibly... Screw this up if you're with me. So basically, for those of you who are doing this the opposite way, um, the audio of this will be at weirdmass.com, um, and this will be um, put into the um, Pulp Fic Lit Pod, the Pulp Fiction Literary Podcast. You can find that on iTunes if you'd rather do it that way. Um, but if you would like to spend the next two years with us on this first issue of Weird Tales, um, you could do that there, or you could do it on the Paperback Junkie YouTube channel. Right? Why two years? Well, there's 22 stories. Uh oh. I'm trying to figure out how to do this. So, basically, what, um, we're going to be doing is we're going to be going through um, this first issue of Weird Tales. Now, I want to really dig into it here. So, this first episode is just going to be us going through, looking at the table of contents, looking at um, the artwork in it, looking at the ads that are in it, um, and then... Each subsequent episode, we will talk about a story or two that's in this issue. Yeah? Mm hmm Okay. So, um, right off the bat, you need to know that Zoe and I are both drinking natural ice. And we have been for some time now. Yes. So, but um, we're fine. Yeah, it might get a little slappy in here. So, um... There's that. But I am an author of um, weird fiction or genre fiction. And Zoe uh, is basically the cover artist for my novels and for many other people's novels. Um, so if you need a book cover done, um, let Zoe know. Um, but she's also just an artist of tons of different mediums. She... Mainly pen and ink portraiture. That's my kind yeah. of thing, isn't it? But... And illustrations and mm -hmm. stuff like that. But what? What were we going to say? Well, I do have my mini monsters. Yes, she does felt um, monsters, too. So, we're going to be looking through this issue of Weird Tales with a critical eye but also uh, I that is an awe, an awe I. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is, one of the reasons why I wanted to do this whole series to start with is that um, I noticed that there's a lot of authors that were huge in the day that I've never actually read. So, the one that comes to mind from Weird Tales is, like, Seabury Quinn. Um, I do not know any of Seabury Quinn's work. And I know that Seabury Quinn was a huge deal in the Weird Tales community. Just like in the Black Mass community, you had Raymond Chandler and Dashiell Hammett. But the one guy who outsold both of those dudes was a guy named Carol John Daly, who I didn't get to start reading 
until like a couple years ago, I guess. And his stuff for me is so amazing. It's just so fast paced and punch you in the mouth, like slobber knocker, hard boiled detective stuff. Whereas Dashiell Hammett um, and more so Raymond Chandler, to me, at least with the dialogue, are a lot more articulate than Carol John Daly was. So there's 22 stories in this issue of Weird Tales, and there's only like three or four authors that I've ever even heard of. So there's a lot of unread talent in here that I feel like deserves a chance. And one of these is on the cover here. So this is Weird Tales, the first issue of the Unique magazine, which we'll talk about why that is in a minute, dated March 1923. It would set you back a quarter to pick up this 194 page monstrosity. But the story on the cover, yeah, you have Ooze, an extraordinary novelette by Anthony M. Rudd. And in case you still weren't sold on it, it's a tale of a thousand thrills. And we're going to count how many there are. Um, it is complete in this issue. Now, Weird Tales, why is this the unique magazine? The reason why this is the unique magazine is because a brief little history of pulps. So in the late 1800s, I think it was about 1895, um, Muncie put out um, the Argosy. And that was technically... Muncie? Muncie was a guy, Frank Muncie. Okay. He, he was like a publisher. I just want to point out that I am... What would you say? Like, I'm a huge fan of all this kind of thing, but I'm not knowledgeable about it. It's just a huge appeal to me. All the artwork, all the stories, the content, everything that's going on in here is hugely appealing to me, but I don't have any knowledge of it whatsoever. So Matt is the person who knows a lot about this kind of stuff. I know enough to get me through a conversation. I well, think. yeah, but you do, but you also have, like... A huge fan appreciation of yeah. pulp fiction in itself, and you have a background knowledge of stuff. Whereas I'm coming into it very, very. But the thing that's weird is that I think you've read probably a lot more of these stories than you think you have. I might have done, yeah. Because you come from reading a lot of like the like Christmas ghost stories and stuff like yeah. that and hearing those. Yeah. And I'm willing to wager that as we continue through this, a lot of these stories you're going to go, oh, I know that. Oh, well, I... we'll see. But I, I know that since I moved to America, I found that very weird that Americans aren't generally, that might be like a really like weird thing to say, but the, the whole concept of reading ghost stories at Christmas time isn't... That is not an, even a thing. No. Like, even now, knowing that that's what you're used to, and I've tried to implement that in, like, our life... Yeah, we really it's have. It's still, like... It's weird doesn't, to you, isn't it? Yeah, because, like, American culture is so, like... Jesus, Christ, Christmas, Santa Claus, Christmas lights. That's yeah. Christmas, you know? Like, now you're getting the kind of Krampus <clears throat> thing coming in a little bit but in the horror genre. We got that through the horror genre. We didn't get that through. It's not a, an American Yeah, it's thing. just it just isn't. No, but to me, growing up, Christmas time is a time to sit by the fire because it's freezing cold and you have a big roaring fire and you tell each other ghost stories or you read ghost stories or you do something because that is christmas time that's you know yeah that's what you do and it's weird and that's a good point like with okay i don't want to get too far ahead of myself here 
But with these early issues of Weird Tales, um, the guy who was editing it, um, I think his name was Edwin Barn Bard. Um, I might be wrong on the first name. Um, but he wasn't necessarily a fan of weird fiction, speculative fiction, science fiction, horror. Um, that wasn't his wheelhouse. Um, the company that put Weird Tales out had another pulp out at the time called, um, I think eventually it became Real Detective Stories. And he was the editor of that, and that was very successful. And so he was into crime fiction and stuff like that. And so when he came in to Weird Tales, the publisher put together Weird Tales basically just because he was a fan of Edgar Allan Poe and didn't feel like there was enough stuff that was, like, gothic-y ghost story enough mm -hmm. to... that was out there. Like, because... Mm -hmm. After the Argosy was put together, I think um, What's the Argosy? that was the first American pulp. Okay. And again, the pulps were based off of the British Penny Dreadfuls and Dime novels. So um, once this took off, it took probably 10 years or so before the first genre-specific pulp came out, and I think that was um, Railroad Men. And it was just stories about dudes on a railroad kind of thing. And that was, like, the first genre-specific um, pulp. And there were other pulps that almost touched what Weird Tales touched. There was um, the Thrill Book, that I think was Street and Smith that put that out. But that still was a very, very tame version of what Weird Tales would become. Mm -hmm. So the other thing about Weird Tales and why it's the unique magazine is that there were a lot of people who were writing stories. Like the pulp writers would write all sorts of different genres if they thought they could sell it. So maybe um, some dude writes a cowboy story, but there's a witch in it or something like that. Or a ghost. Or a ghost. Then the people at All Western would go, yeah, we don't want this because there's a ghost and a witch in it or something. So they're like, ah, crap. Well, okay, I'll just put this in my rejected file and never look at it again. And then somebody else writes a story about a World War I fighting ace who um, maybe died and was still telling the story or something like that. Well, that's too weird. Um, we don't do that here. So that goes in the reject pile. So Weird Tales was basically, to me, I feel like it was more for the writers than it was for the readers. Because it was a place where anything that a writer could write, no matter how bizarre or weird it was, um, would have a place if it was well written and not like jumbled together. I mean, throughout the but they years, must have had a, they must have thought that they had an audience for it. You know. Well, yeah, because the publisher. The guy who was running the show, not the editor of the magazine, but the guy who was bankrolling everything, yeah. was someone who was the audience for it. Okay. And in fact, in later times when Weird Tales wasn't doing good, the, this guy I'm talking about, whose name escapes me at the minute, he ends up selling his shares of the real detective stories to somebody else, or to his partner, so he could have enough money to keep Weird Tales afloat for a little really? bit. And try to, like, restructure it. Um, so, Bard was not um, a huge fan of this work. But he did know what a ghost story was. And that was kind of like, I think, his... Like, I just gotta put ghost stories in here. Yeah. You know? Um, make them kind of scary. 
So that was... This, what date was this, are we talking? March 1923 okay. was when this was on the stands. So this is like flappers. Well, yeah. also very much seance -y, Yeah. Um, all that kind of victorian -y kind of... Yeah, because all the people who <clears throat> were now... That's adults. not Victorian, is it? No, no, no. I'm just saying, but that kind of era came through. Yeah, because, like, all the people who were adults at this time were the people who, when they were kids, Edgar Allan Poe, well, yeah. actually, he was a, a little bit before that, but I'm sure they would have known about the Raven, yeah. like the Tell Tell Heart yeah. or something like that. Um, Robert Chambers, um, Algernon Blackwood, M.R. James... Like, all of these were, like, probably probably household names to people who read stuff. Yeah. So, um, that probably wasn't a huge far-fetch uh, kind of deal. So, let's right now just look at this cover. Okay. What do you think of this cover? Um... It's very watercolory. I can see the watercolor kind of thing going on. There's yes. a, a kind of there's, there's not a lot of detail going on in there. Um, there's your woman in peril. Is, of, is that an octopus? It looks like an octopus with its like tentacles round her, but she's kind of kind of scantily clad. Would you say for twenties? Well, now that I'm looking at it, yeah, I don't think she's, she's got any pants on. No, it's kind of... Like, is that a slip that's been pulled up and she just no, has shaved like... herself? <laughs> no, it looks like a kind of black dress that has been... I don't know. You could see all the way up. I think that's her belly button. Yeah. But I don't think he meant to think that. I think he meant to be like, she's scantily clad. But that's kind of high up on the thighs. Yeah, like, it goes all the way up. She hasn't got a lot of the boobage. But is yeah. that a shirt or is that more tentacle? Well, I don't know. I can't Why is she wearing the same color shirt as her hero? I don't know. Maybe there was a limit on ink. Maybe they were on a bowling team. Maybe so. But it looks like she has, a, a like, a blouse over a, I don't know. But the whole thing is kind of, there's not a lot of detail. They're both looking... Are the kind of area that doesn't focus in on what is the threat. That's true. Like you know she's looking. She's looking, and I think that's a bear. I uh, don't know if that's a bear. I don't know what the fuck. That, oh, I don't know what that is. There's like a kind of big black shadow with goggly eyes in the background. That's kind of that doesn't appear to be the tentacle part of it. I don't know what's going on. And then he's looking at his knife. Yeah, he looks like he's looking at his knife. So, as far... I mean, I'm not an expert on this by any means whatsoever. But judging from modern day or even, what, 40s, 50s, 60s comic book covers? They're both... It's not... It's kind of dynamic that they're both in action doing something I can't tell who did this I can't read what that says at the bottom and I couldn't find anything when I was looking no but like the faces of these two people are exactly the same they're very similar and very like then they don't appear to be looking at the threat that I hate the eyes them. no yeah me too <clears throat> even the goggly eyes on the not bear I know, it's just, like, yeah. It's, it's just bad. But, having said that, this is like looking from a modern day perspective. I, if I was, like, someone in the 20s looking at this, I would probably think, oh my god, this looks amazing. There's a bee. There's a bee. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think and you love octopus. I do like octopus, octopi, and bear. Yeah. So this would probably have been a straight pickup for me. But... There's not a lot of, I don't know. Oh, he's got a gun, too. I didn't even notice that. Yeah, he's got a rifle. I've been staring at this for hours Me today. Me, too, and I didn't realize that. But I don't... It's not... I think we're looking at it from, like I say, modernized. I think if you looked at it... But having said that, 
there were artists around this time that were doing absolutely incredible stuff. This isn't the best example for a cover, but still, you know, if you're in the 20s and you're looking at something, you might think, hmm, octopus, weird shadow. I don't know if it's a bear. But it's I'm a more, shadow monster thing. I can't believe that I never noticed that she doesn't have any panties on. You had to point that out to me. Not to be a jerk or nothing, but that's usually the first thing I just, see. But like, yeah, I know. You would see yeah. that. But I don't know, because this is so early, I don't know, like, if that's just bad perspective that she hasn't managed to, like, whoever drew this hasn't managed to you know, cover it up a little bit more because that's way too high on the thigh to not be in the pelvic region. Yeah. I, th- instead of an octopus, this could be a gynecologist. Yes. Yes. And her arm keeps freaking me out, but that should be there, I guess. But it's it's very difficult. It is kind of low now that you pointed that out. It's coming out of her hip bone. Yeah. But still, I would look at it It's and a watercolour. It's a watercolour. There's a weird guy, very starey with big eyebrows, looking at his knife. And I would be like, well, that looks interesting. It looks better than whatever else. And for those of you who are just out. listening to the audio of this, this um, the cover story is Ooze. Um, I said that a little bit earlier by Anthony M. Rudd. Um, the one thing that I will say that I like is that I kind of do like the Weird Tales logo on this. Damn. I'm not... I don't know why. It just, it seems fun. Well, you're a fan of, like, minimalist, I would say. And I'm not, I don't know, that looks like a school project to me. I don't know, a little bit later, um, I think probably after issue four. Actually, when I think it's issue three. When did the logo that stuck? Well, that's different, because, like, if you could see this one yeah, right yeah, here, yeah. that's way later. Okay. But, um, if you notice this has a white border, it will eventually, I think by issue two or three, come to think of it, it goes to a red border with, like, a cursive, um, lettering. And I've never really liked that. From someone who does covers... Now and again, I can't see anybody I know ever voting for that kind of font with the colours and stuff. But again, this is a, a long is time Is it because ago. it's like wiggling, the red lines are wiggling into the It's titles? just that the whole font, everything, it's just, I'm not, I don't know, I'm not a fan. But, who knows, if I was looking at it in the time that it was printed, I might be very different. But it doesn't even, it doesn't shout out to me either. That is true. It's just like somebody's just... And like what we were talking about um, with the red border, it was probably just to get more attention on a shelf of 500 pulps. Yeah, you've got to come up with something or other, don't you, to... Well, one of the things we're going to talk about, too, is the advertisements that are in here. Because, again, this is amazing. So this first one we have um, on the back of the front cover is wow. Get Ready for a Big Pay Job. 75 to 200 a week. You can be a big money maker. Jumps from $125 a month to $750 and over. Age or lack of education, no handicap. Cash in on your spare time, and you can get your electrical working outfit for free. Oh my god! I guarantee your complete satisfaction and act right now. And if you don't believe what we're saying here at the Chicago Engineering Works Department 179 on Lawrence Avenue in Chicago, read this little letter from. Someone who looks like a cage fighter. W. He's e- terrified. W. E. Pence 
in his working togs. If he's not a wrestler or a boxer, <laughs> I'll eat my hat. I swear to God, they took like the head of a fighter yeah, and just put it, it in like a work outfit. Flat top, big head, cauliflower ears. Cauliflower ears yeah. and a smash nose. Yeah. Um, so men like you were needed right now to fill big pain jobs in the electrical field. There's never, there never was a time when opportunities for making money were so good as they are now. Good jobs are open everywhere to men who know what's what. Um, <laughs> you can make twelve to thirty dollars a day. Um, there's all sorts. I mean, again, you should be reading W. E. Pence's letter below. Um, wow. So that's an opportunity I mean, that people should have been jumping on. I've trained over 20,000 men in electricity. Thousands of successful men all over the world attribute their success to my training. Yeah. Now, we were talking about this earlier because, again, this is like six years before the crash. Um, is this another, a year? No, a month. No. Oh, it is. 125 a month. Yeah. To 750. Like, I'd be all over that. Yeah, but like we were talking about this. So this is right before, not right before, but in, for the most part, right before the Great Depression. And also, this is kind of when a lot of big cities were probably starting to become completely electrified, completely on the grid, you know? So there's going to be... A there was probably a ton of work. Yeah. yeah. Um, like so, majorly for yeah. everybody who would be even vaguely Completely qualified. Completely like, like redoing the entire infrastructure of complete cities. Yeah. Um, so this is probably right up there. And yeah, probably one guy would get seven fifty a month because he became like the foreman or something like that. But every other knob would get like a hundred bucks, yeah, probably if they're lucky. And I mean, 1923 money—that's probably pretty good. So you're telling me that would be pretty impressive. Yeah. So if you want to do this, you just let LL Cook know. He's a chief engineer in Chicago. <laughs> so um, get on that. Works. Yeah, get yeah. on that. So now we're going to um, the third page here, which is the um, table of contents here. Now, I have to say that everything on this table of contents I actually love. Edwin Bard, no, right? Edward. Edwin. I think you said Edward. Bad. 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 I mean, I said B Edward Bad. B A I R D. Bad. Bed. He bed what his teeth. What did you say it was? What did bed. you Bed. Bed. Okay. Like, Carry on. Okay. Um, first off, I love the two tone checkers. Now. You're a fan of Vans, so yeah. you would like that. And, and you're British, so that's specials. the Metro Police Department. Yes. So that looks so good. Right? That's the man. <laughs> that's the man. I'm just kidding. I do like it. It's very catchy. That's not the right word, but you know. It's just, it's nice looking. It is. It's so, good. Like it says, this is volume one, 25 cents, number one. Um, it has a bunch of really small print that's like, this is all the information you need to know. But um, then we have contents for March 1923. Oh my God, that's almost 100 years ago. I know. Can you imagine? Oh yeah. my god. So 22 remarkable short stories. So we have The Mystery of Black Jean. Probably as PC as it sounds. Mm. A story um, of blood curdling realism. Realism with a smashing surprise at the end. See, why does he have to tell me there's a surprise? I don't know, because now I'm going to be waiting for it. Well, this it. is by Julian Kilman. Okay. I've looked up Julian Kilman all over the place. Not finding. I can't find a damn thing. Really? And that story is going to be true. In fact, I will tell you when I was able to find information on these people. The other thing I noticed was this is the first table of contents I've ever seen that starts with pages farther back in the magazine or book. Really? We start at page 41. Yeah, that's weird. And then when we get to, like... Other bits, it'll say, oh, that starts on page seven. 
I've never yeah, seen anything no. like that. Um, <clears throat> then we have The Grave by Orville R. Emerson. A soul-gripping story of terror. Wow. <sighs> then, Hark! The Rattle by Joel Townsend Rogers. Townsley. I think it's Townsley. Well, Joel Rogers. An uncommon tale that will cling to your memory for many a day. Mm -hmm. there's, there's a lot of... Uh... Are we going through all of these? Is this bothering you? <laughs> no. We have The Ghost Guard by Brian Irvine. A spooky tale with a grim background. Then The Ghoul and the Corpse by G.A. Wells. An amazing yarn of weird adventure in the frozen north. Now, right there, I'm up for that. <laughs> You're so easy. I know. <laughs> That's Seriously, like... anything kind of cold, snowy. And scary. And scary. I'm all over that. Wow. Okay, so we have Fear by David R. Solomon. Showing how fear can drive a strong man. To the Verge of Insanity. The Place of Madness by Merlin Moore Taylor. What two hours in a prison, solitary, did to a man? Ooh, probably The Closing Hand. Yeah. Um, I'm glad no one saw that. Now this is by um, Farnsworth Wright, which we'll talk about um, later, but he ends up being a very critical part of Weird Tales in the future. And it is a brief story, powerfully written. <laughs> like I was kind of getting all excited, but that's kind of a bit lackluster. That is. Wouldn't you like, say? This has words. Yeah. Um, okay, let's see here. The Unknown Beast by Howard Ellis Davis. An unusual tale of a terrifying monster. Nice. Mm -hmm. The Basket. Ooh. By Herbert James J. Mangum. A queer little story about San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> that would probably be more relevant now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the Accusing Voice by Meredith Davis. The Singular Experience of Alan Defoe. Ooh. Mm. Just Intriguing. a singular one. Now this one's kind of neat. The sequel by Walter Scott Story. A new conclusion to Edgar Allan Poe's Task of a Montebello. A digio. A Montelado. Oh. That's how I A Montelado, yes. Is it a Montedillo? No, a Montelado. Oh, okay. You're right. I just read it right. That's kind of interesting. Yeah, right? it is. It's wow. Cool. Oh, contents for March 1923 continued. Wow, so you're going to have to keep going with this. Yeah. The Weaving Shadows by W.H. Holmes. Chet Burke's Strange Adventures in a Haunted House. Nimba the Cave Girl by R.T.M. Scott. An odd, fantastic little story of the Stone Age. Now, R.T.M. Scott is um, another author from... <clears throat> here that I know from other things because RTM Scott wrote at least the first two um, spider novels. Really? Yeah. Ooh, I think four. Maybe it's just two. Um, then the next one is The Young Man Who Wanted to Die by Three Question Marks. Ooh. An anonymous author submits a startling <coughs> Answer. Answer to the question, what comes after death? My guess is that this is probably either <clears throat> Farnsworth Wright or um, Otis Albert Klein, which we'll talk about later. Okay. Um, the Scarlet Night by William Sanford. A tale with an eerie thrill. Ooh. Mm. The Extraordinary Experiment of Dr. Cal Groney by Joseph Foss and James Bennett Wooding. Jesus okay. fucking Christ. Yeah, that's lengthy. Wordy. An eccentric doctor creates a frightful living thing. Oh that's my gosh. 
familiar. Like Frankenstein. Mm -hmm. um, the Return of Paul Slavsky, I didn't even know he was gone, <laughs> by Captain George Warburton Lewis. A creepy tale that ends in a shuddering, breathtaking way. Wow. The House of Death, by F. Georgia Stroop. The Strange Secret of a Lonely Woman. Wow. <laughs> the Gallows by I.W.D. Peters. Hmm. Here's another one. An out-of-the-ordinary story. Wow. Not hugely selling, but you never know. I.D.W. my Peter, too. <laughs> <laughs> the minute you hear the gallows, I'm kind of in a anyway, yeah. so. Go. The Skull by Harold Ward. A grim tale with a terrifying end. Do you think that Baird just kind of like gave up? Yeah, it sounds like, like he's, he's running like, out. Jesus Christ, there's how many stories are you Yeah, in? there's a lot of stories. Okay, The Ape Man by James Bowel Movement Clark Jr. That's B.M. Clark. A jungle tale that is somehow <laughs> different. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, man. Am I, like, smashing you? No. Nope. Okay. So that was hysterical. But guess what? Besides those 22 short stories, we have three unusual novelettes. The Dead Man's Tale by Willard E. Hawkins. Where's that? Oh. Um, an astounding yarn that will hold you spellbound and make you breathe fast with a new mental sensation. Wow. Maybe you did that first because it was the page Saurus. seven. Yeah. And that's what I'm talking about. So we're on page seven now because these are the novelettes. Yeah. And then we have the cover story, Ooze, by Anthony M. Red. A, remar a remarkable short stubble by... <laughs> Start again. A remarkable short novel by a master of goose flesh. <laughs> Do you want to tell everyone what you just did? <laughs> I glinked a little bit there. Wow, that is like the nicest way of putting what just happened. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. And then we have The Chain by Hamilton Craigie. Craigie, Craigie, it looks like, is at his best here. Well, that's good to know. Yeah, that's good. Um, and then we have a strange novel in two parts. The Thing of a Thousand Shapes by Otis Albert Klein. Don't Albert. start this star story. <laughs> ah! <laughs> <laughs> Don't start this story late at night. Because you'll probably <laughs> fall asleep. Because it sounds like it might be kind of long. Um... Am I sitting on something? She's yeah. pulling something out from under my behind. Yeah. Ugh. Okay. Whew. Well, it's a good thing that you were at your best there. Because mm -hmm. I might not have got off of that. So now it says the eerie. Is that how you say that? Mm -hmm. That's how I've always pronounced it, but I've heard people say like, I like an eagle's eerie. Okay, so what that is, is the editor responding to letters. Now, this is the first issue, and for some reason, they're, I guess because they were probably talking about this coming out in the real detective stories, so um, they actually did get some mail, or they faked a bunch of letters. But this is one of the things that I really liked. Also, a number of odd facts and queer fancies crowded in for good measure. Mm -hmm. So for advertising rates and weird tales, apply to Young and Ward Advertising Managers at 168 North Michigan Boulevard, Chicago, Illinois. Mm -hmm. Well, that's very interesting. It is. So now <clears throat> there's a advertisement inside Weird Tales to let you know what a goose flesh story is, because that was something that came up in those amazing editorials, right? Yep. So, tales of horror or goose flesh stories 
are commonly shunned by magazine editors. Few, if any, will consider such a story, no matter how interesting it may be. They believe that the public doesn't want this sort of fiction. We, however, believe otherwise. We believe there are tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of intelligent readers who really enjoy goose flesh stories. Hence, Weird we Tales. Tales. Weird Tales offers such fiction as you can find in no other magazine. Fantastic stories, extraordinary stories, grotesque stories, stories of a strange and bizarre adventure, the sort of stories in brief that will startle and amuse you. Amaze you. I think it will still be amusing. <laughs> Every story in this issue of Weird Tales is an odd and remarkable flight of a man's imagination. Some are creepy. Some deal in masterly fashion with forbidden subjects like insanity. Some are concerned with the supernatural and others with material things of horror are, are out of the ordinary. Surprisingly new and unusual. A sensational departure from the beaten track. That is the reason for... Weird Test. Weird Test. The Unique mm. Magazine. Now, I would have been totally on board. Yeah. And just so you guys know, we're reading this off of, like, scanned copies. Um, and sometimes... The print's a little bit difficult to read. Yeah. Now, after reading this next bit here, this is what made Zoe go. I'm kind of jealous... I kind of want to do this podcast with you after all. Mm -hmm. Because believe it or not, when I pitched this show to Zoe, she said, mm, no. Just because I don't know anything about it. But it's very interesting. It is really interesting. So, a radiant bride at 20? At 25? What? Is the husband or wife to blame? Is the husband or wife to blame for the tragedy of too many children? Margaret Sanger, the great birth control advocate, comes with a message vital to every married man and woman. This is fascinating. Now, this image here, this mm -hmm. illustration, this looks like, I believe it's Hugh Rankin, who ends up doing a ton of interior illustrations for weird tales mm -hmm. but um so i'm very curious about this if anyone knows the answer to that please let me know what that is um and this ad it's a full page ad i think we should describe the picture people um, aren't gonna... there's some chick it's... like head down on a table like it's very dark print um, is that like a skeleton? Like a skull? Like death coming for her? It looks like it is, but I don't know if that's just the back of the chair. It's a background that's very black. It could be a coat wrap. Yeah, I'm not sure. But With all her many kids' coats? Yeah. <laughs> there's basically a woman, very dark pen and ink drawing, illustration, and she's basically leaning over the table you know, on a folded arms in utter despair. She's probably crying. Her knuckles look like they're covered in blood. Probably because not only was she having to, like, deal with all five children, she was probably having to, like, like tenderize beef with her bare knuckles. Like, if she could afford beef, which is hardly unlikely. But not with five children. No. Not exactly. in 1923, unless her husband was an electrician. In which case... She could afford all the beef she wanted. <laughs> but she looks pretty miserable, let's yeah. just say it. And also... What? The tea, which starts... The thousands, whole, yeah. Yeah, the, for the thousands of the first paragraph, looks like something out of a medieval Bible. It totally does. Yeah. Now, I'm I don't sure know anything about this Margaret Sanger chick. But after reading this, I'm like, she was probably like a big deal. Probably, she people must have probably been. thought she was a communist or yeah. like a Nazi sympathizer. There must have been something going on to get her on the, it's like the first page of advertising. It's and a this is a page. big page, yeah. yeah. 
Okay, so I'm going to try to read. I wasn't going to read this all until I read it, and I'm like, this is ridiculous. So thousands upon thousands of... Yeah, it's difficult to read. Women today marry with the bloom of youth upon their cheeks. Checks. I thought that said checks too, but why would there be anything on their check? I don't know. I think it's cheeks. A few years of married life rub the bloom off. I mean, we've been married for like five years. And yeah. I've rubbed your bloom off many times. And we haven't had any problems. I've never seen you sit like that lady. There's been all sorts of bloom rubbing. Um, Children come too many. And instead of the energetic, healthy girl, we have a tired and bedraggled young old old woman. woman. Why do women allow marriage, the holy thing, to work this wicked transformation? Well, Margaret Sanger, the acknowledged world leader of the birth control movement and president of the American Birth Control League, has the answer for this most monumentous problem of womankind. Every married woman knows only too well the tragedies resulting from ignorance of birth control. Why should a woman sacrifice her love life? A P. A something she otherwise uses every resource to keep. Mm. Why does she give birth? Possession. A possession she otherwise uses every resource. Okay. Why does she give birth to a rapid succession of children if she has neither the means to provide for them nor the physical strength properly to care for them? In her daring and startling book, Margaret Sanger gives the women of the world the knowledge she dared to print. The knowledge for which she faced jail and fought through every court to establish as women's... That's a... I don't know if there's a space in there. Mm. Women should know this is basically what it says. In Women and the New Race... She shows how women can and will rise above the forcey forcey that too forces ma- forces that too many something have ruined her beauty through the ages cases, cases have ruined her beauty through the ages that still drag her down today that wreck her mental and physical strength that disqualify her from society for self-improvement that finally finally shut her out from, from the, the thing, she, thing cherishes. she cherishes most, her husband's love. Wow. I mean... So, this was in 1923. And this is pulling at heartstrings here. In... What's that word? Blazing this revolutionary trail to the new freedom of women, this daring and heroic author points out that women who cannot afford to have more More than than one or two children should not do so. It is a crime to herself, a crime to her children, a crime to society. And now, for the first time, Miss Sanger, or Mrs. Sanger, I guess there is a husband there somewhere. Shows the way out. And she brings to the women of the world the greatest message it has ever been their good fortune to receive. Women and the New Race is a book that will be read whenever womankind struggle with the over-present danger of too many children. I don't care! (laughs) It is a startling... It is a startling, mighty revelation of a new truth, a work that will open the eyes of the tired, worn womankind. It can, with truth and honesty, be called 
women's salvation. salvation. Every woman in the country should have a copy of this remarkable and courageous work. For this reason, we have arranged a special edition of Women and the New Race at only $2 a copy. Wow. Send no money. Just give it to the postman when he shows up with your book that's in a plain wrapper so no one knows you're a communist. Oh, I just find this fascinating that all this was going on in 1923. Totally. And here, here's a partial list of the contents. Women's error and her debt. Two classes of women. Cries of despair. When should a woman avoid having children? Birth control. A parent's problem or woman's? I can't read that or that. Contraceptives or abortion? Women in the new morality. Legislating women's morals. Why not birth control clinics in America? Progress we have made. Any one of these chapters alone is worth many times the price of the book. Well, whew, this is pretty startling stuff. I would like to see what this woman... I want to see if this book's on Goodreads. I know. Where's your phone? I don't know. I don't know where my phone is. No. But look, on the thing that you have to cut out to mail in for the thing, it's like, gentlemen, please send me in a plain wrapper Margaret Singer's book. But it's just funny because it's like, gentlemen, can I please have the abortion book now? Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's nuts in itself. Yeah. It's just like, you have to ask your husband <laughs> if you can get the book. In the first place. And he's like... And then no. you have to ask other people's husbands. Yeah. Gentlemen, may wow. I please have the book about condoms? Don't, yeah, don't say out loud. But it's just crazy because, again, in the 20s, there we weren't at the point yet where we had the Hayes Code or the Comics Code or censorship or anything like that. It wasn't until... Um, into the 30s when the government started like policing everything people did and so because to me if this ad showed up in this magazine in 1940 this magazine would never again see the light of day the editor would never get a job again because he was that abortion guy that let that communist sociopath woman that put mm -hmm. her book up there. And it's how just, many it's women crazy. would be reading weird tales? I don't know. In the 1920s. Margaret Sanger. We're going to have to look her up. Yeah. Maybe yeah. do an update. Yeah. All right. Um, you could also get this 21 Jewel Burlington for only a dollar down. I guess a what? Burlington is a clock, a thermometer, and and then other things that that helps you find commies in the neighborhood adjusted to what the second see here's the clock and then mm -hmm. here's some other thing here's another thing and then that says eked wow the so burlington petite oh yeah. A lady's wristwatch. That's a watch? I thought it was something you hang up on the wall. No, I think there's a different version, look. Oh. Oh, because that's a pocket watch, and that's a pocket watch, and that's a pocket watch, and that's a wristwatch. Yes, there you go. I okay. thought this was like a big giant thing you hang up on the no. wall. Okay, that makes more sense now. That's a pocket watch, the wristwatch. Right today. Oh, here we go. So, we go into the first... Um, tail and because we're already in an hour why don't we stop mm -hmm. and we can come back to this because i'm reading the dead man's tale by willard e hawkins right now and i mean honestly for a scout prickling thrill and stark terror read this is this is good yeah we're enjoying it yeah so we'll come back and talk to you about this at another time yeah yeah so bye for me Bye from you. It's bye. Goodbye from him. <laughs> <laughs>
Two Ronnies. Classic. Classic. <laughs>